alive. Well, I'm so glad I'm alive. How about you? So today is the last day in February. Um, we're going to talk about that in a minute. And we're going to also right now just open in prayer. I'm Pastor Jan from Christian uh, Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship, married to Mike Osminski, um, senior pastor. And um, let me open in prayer right now. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity, this great opportunity we have to be able to come together through through technology, Lord, that we're able to come together and still hear the Word of God and worship you, Lord. We thank you today that Allison was so in tune with your spirit, Lord, that uh, she ministered to all of you out there that... Um, that are hurting, dear God. Her songs were incredible. I felt the Holy Spirit moving. So we thank you, Lord, for um, that she's so in tune. Lord, thank you, Jesus. And, and today, Lord, bless the word. Uh, continue to bless the direction you want it to go. And, um, and that's it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Well, as uh, usual, I'm going to open with a psalm. Psalm uh, 125. It's a short psalm, and I'm going to tie it in with a story. Uh, so if you want to turn your Bibles to um, Psalm 125, and I don't know the page number. I always have my kids, are, what page, what page? I don't know what page your Bible's on. Mine is 839, so anyway. Let's begin. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. Wow. So you're telling me, Lord, if I trust in you, I'm going to be like a mountain. Not just any mountain, but your mountain, Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. Wow. As the mountains surround Jerusalem... So the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. Well, trusting in the Lord is really important. It's a characteristic in our Christian life that is right up there. We, we, it's also important that we have trust in our Lord to build that relationship. We have fear of the Lord. We have um, love of the Lord. And and through all those things, we know who he is. Again, so many times we've heard that people have uh, not really known him. They, they heard of him, but it wasn't until they actually knew him that their lives changed. So when we keep doing all those things, we will, oops, we will uh, feel secure in him. And when we stay how he wants us to be, how we need to be, trusting him, loving him, fearing him, knowing him. Those mountains are surrounding us and they're protecting us from evil. You know, I think it's really awesome that he says that we're like mountains. That I mean, so many of us don't see ourselves that way. We, we just don't see ourselves. But, you know, if you look in the scriptures, if you look in Matthew, um, he compares some people to sand shifting. They're, you know, Matthew seven twenty six shifting and unstable. I don't want to be that kind of believer. I don't want to have that kind of witness. He said some people are like the sea. They're restless and unsettled. You can look in Isaiah five seven for that one. I'm sorry, fifty seven twenty, or James one six. Some people are like the wind. Um, they're uncertain and inconsistent, Ephesians 4, 14. I want to be the mountain. I want to be strong and stable and secure. I want um, people to know that if they come to me, that's what they're going to find. They're not going to find some wishy-washy person shifting around, but I'm going to be strong and stable in the Lord for them. So God is really doing a work in all of us in this hour. Um, we're surrounded by those mountains. And I, and I think that imagery is so strong. 
you know, Mount Zion was in the middle of this mountain range and the other mountains really protected it. It was secure. Those mountains were like sentinels that were on duty, protecting the capital, protecting the most high. And if we think ourselves, if we are like, God has totally surrounded us, like the mountains, totally surrounds us. What a good place to be. Now, sometimes um, we wonder, how, how come then this happened to me? If I'm surrounded by God, why did this happen to me? Well, God allows, um, he, he allows things to get in, to break the barrier and to enter. He permits it. He permits it. So we have uh, basically a divine appointment with him. So when things happen to us, it's not meant to be bad or, or awful. It's meant to bring us to a closer place with him. You know, maybe what you're going through today, does you don't feel like you're any closer. But guess what? What you're going through today is bringing other people closer. Because we are one body and we feel the pain. We feel everything you're going through. So if you're hurting, I'm hurting. And I can push in. And I can, and if I was like not, not doing well with the Lord, this might be a wake-up call for me. And because of your suffering, it's, yes, it's, it's giving you a divine appointment, but it's also causing me to have a divine appointment. Because I might look at you and say, well, if this happens to her, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to get on my knees and pray for her. Pray. So I think, again, we have to remember when one suffers in the body, we all suffer. And it's meant, it's meant for our good, if you can even believe that. You can even believe that. So when we continue reading this, um, and it's real important that last portion from this time forth and forever, God is going to always surround his people forever, ever and ever. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest. It, you could take out scepter and put the rule of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity. So again, we're seeing that, you know what, if we're going to stay, if we're going to stay upright, let me just keep reading there so I don't mess this up here. Um, I lost my place. Let me start over. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous reach out their hand to iniquity. Oh, good. Do good, O oh Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. And we're going to be reading a story today about a young black man who actually did something good. Didn't expect a reward, but we'll let you know what happened to him. But I just want you to say the upright always accepts things to be for the best. So whenever, after the dust settles and, and you know, the pain is somewhat subsided and the shock is somewhat subsided, you know that God is doing this for a reason. To bring out your best so he can shine his best. Um, the upright always adhere to him. You cling to him. You adhere to him. So that you will entirely be conformed to his image. You know, I keep thinking, like last Sunday we talked about um, the journey. When Jesus was on that um, donkey or cult, whatever it was, and riding into Jerusalem and and the people were shouting, and we said, that is the day the Lord has made. Maybe today is the, the day the Lord has made for you to ride triumphantly through your um, challenge. That's what the Lord wants. He wants you to conform to his image and likeness. And he wants us to do these things at all times, whether it's in times of prosperity or times of adversity. Sometimes I think, it's easier to cling to him when we're in adversity. Um, because when, when it's good times, we just many times just forget about him. 
we don't get to our knees. We don't, we don't cry out to him. We just feel so, so secure in our existence. Okay. And then for, as for such as turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them away with the workers of iniquity. Peace be upon Israel. Now, again, we're seeing in this hour that many people, um, we have, we have a division of thought in our, in the church. And we're seeing that honestly, uh, we have to always remind ourselves that we are a follower of Jesus. And if we can do that and keep on track with that, we will be fine. But when we go to the left or go to the right, and when we get off the straight and narrow path, we, we can be headed into trouble. And so we have to always remember to stay on that straight and narrow path, not go on the crooked paths that lead off from the main path. Now, you know, this month has been a celebration uh, for um, uh, black Americans. It has been designated, it's, it began, um, actually, a Black History Week began in 1926 by a, main, a man by the name of Carter, uh, I think his name was Carter G. Woodson, who was an educated man, uh, was at a conference, I believe, in Chicago. I could have that wrong. And he um, realized that, you know, there should be some, some place where Africans, people of color, are acknowledged for their accomplishments. So it became a week a celebration, and um, then and that that marked the fiftieth anniversary, nineteen twenty six of um, I believe I could be wrong on this the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, and then fifty years later in nineteen seventy six, Gerald President Gerald Ford um, made it the History Month. So we had a whole month, and you know I have noticed that we are seeing more and more unknown people uh, being brought out. Uh, you know, we all know the famous ones, but there are so, so many uh, people of color that have done so, so many amazing things. In fact, every day you may be using some of the things they invented and you didn't even know it. Um, the traffic light was invented by Garrett uh, Morgan, um, and he also invented the traffic light, and he also invented a gas mask to be used in World War I. Uh, Sarah Boone invented the ironing board. Thank you very much, Sarah Boone, for that. We appreciate that. But anyway, you know, obviously she was a slave, slave and her job was to iron the, the master's garments, and back then it wasn't easy, and so she uh, created an invention uh, to meet the need. Now, I want to say that a lot of the inventions that maybe were designed and created by uh, these people, they didn't get credit for, and they didn't get um, a copyright for, because they were slaves. In fact, um, if you look up Sarah Boone, you probably won't even know the date she was born, because there, no, there was no birth certificate for her. Uh, Alfred Crumb, no, I'm getting that wrong. Alfred Crumb designed the ice cream scoop. Uh, I forget the guy's name. Maybe I'm getting mixed up. There was one fellow who made potato chips. A, a black man. He owned a restaurant. He was cooking. He sent the the French fries out to the customer. The customer griped and complained and said these weren't whatever. He liked them. So uh, the black man got mad, overcooked them, sent them out, and they were hit. And that's how we got uh, potato chips. Does Did he have a copyright on it? I have no idea. And some of these people just kind of vanished then. They did not become wealthy. Um, but we, so if it just, just Google um, African American inventors and you will be amazed at the things they invented. Uh, some were high technology. Uh, Dr. Patricia Bath, she invented things for the eyes. Uh, technology for the ice. There's just so much out there. But anyway, this is going to lead me to, um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of going blab babbling here, but I want us to look at Jeremiah. Um, we're going to be looking at Jeremiah. I'm going to actually skim through it quickly for you, and I'm going to give you the background. It, it has to do with Jeremiah the prophet. And you know, Jeremiah, um, he was the lucky guy that was uh, the Lord called on to give bad news to King Zedekiah. And we all know what that usually happens when you are appointed to give the bad news. 
Think of John the Baptist. Well, we know how he ended up. So here's poor Jeremiah. And he was told he had to go to the king. And he had to tell the king what the Lord said to him. Um, and let me find where he said. Chapter 37. I'm sorry. And I'm going to start with... Um, Uh, verse 9. No, not verse 9. Verse 6. And then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of me, Pharaoh's army, which has marched out to support you, will go back to its own land, to Egypt. Then the Babylonians will return and attack the city. They will capture it and burn it down. Whoa. And so, you know, the king, uh, and then this is what the Lord says, do not deceive yourselves thinking the Babylonians will surely leave us. They will not. Even if you were to defeat the entire Babylonian army that is attacking you and only wounded men were left in their tents, they would come out and burn the city down. And so Jeremiah was like, he, you know, he, he was just like, oh, great. And um, he, he, he gives the news to the king. And then, um, so let me read again. And um, he asked, he asked, you know, the, the king asked Jeremiah, any word from the Lord? And he says, yes, you will be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon. Whoa, not good news. And then he says, um, what crime have I committed against you or your attendants or, or this people? You have put me in prison. Now, Jeremiah, this is, I'm going to skip that part, but Jeremiah was put into prison. And then what happens in 38 is, um, uh, Jeremiah's, uh, I mean, the king has officials in the court that hear what Jeremiah has said. And you know what? They don't like this. They, they're going to side with the king. And the king, I want to say, is a spineless man. He he doesn't stand up to anybody. He's very wishy-washy. So, okay, so his man get in his ear and say, you know what, you need to do something with this Jeremiah. Shut him up. And, and they, he's just like, do whatever. Do whatever you want. So they take him and they 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 put a rope around him and they put him down a well in, uh, it's called a cistern in your Bible, and it's dry. There's no water, and it's just mud at the bottom. Can you imagine what's down at his feet? And they lower him carefully down with a rope because, you see, those little guys are really pretty sh shifty. They don't want blood on their hands. They don't want blood. They don't want to say, we killed Jeremiah. So they're just going to let him starve to death, and then it'll just be, oh, well, it was just up to the elements, and he just died. So he's now in this cistern or this well, and he's down in this mucky mud. Now, in the courts, there was a man named Ibed Malik, and he was uh, from Cush. He was actually a black man. His name meant a servant of the king. Now, they say, I, I, I read some things on him, and... They're not thinking that that's his real name. That was just a term because they're saying they couldn't pronounce his name. He probably had a name that they couldn't even pronounce. So he was referred to as servant of the king. Now, servant there does not mean he was a slave. It meant that he was an official. He, he was a high-ranking official in the court of uh, Zedekiah. So he goes up to Zedekiah. He's just so outraged of the injustice of this. Because this man spoke for the Lord, you're going to kill him? And he's outraged. He, he's so upset about the injustice. So he goes before the king and he basically says, look, look what he says here. Um, um, I think it's in verse 9. My Lord, the king, these men have acted wickedly and all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him in a cistern where he will starve to death. When there is no longer any bread in the city. And the king, again, wishy-washy king. You know, thank goodness he was wishy-washy. He said, take 30 men, get some rags and rope, and go get them out. And so he did. He took the men, went to uh, in, in the treasury, and he took out some old rags and worn out clothes from there and let them down with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. They rescued him. And um, again, gently, 
Gently, they probably put the, ro- the rags under his arms and gently with the ropes pulled him up. It, that, that's like such a, a, a symbol and a visual of how God treats us. You know, we're stuck. Sometimes we're stuck in mud and we're not going anywhere. He doesn't abruptly just yank us. He gently pulls us out of it, gently. What a sign, what, what a symbol of caring and a loving God that he would do that. So he gently brings them up. And then uh, we go on. And what I'm just going to rush through this. And what ends up happening, you can probably guess, is that, yes, they were attacked. Uh, the king would not listen to Jeremiah. He would not listen. They were attacked. King uh, Zebediah, sons were killed. There was blunder and the city was burned. Women were rescued. Children were taken out. What happened to uh, Abed and what happened to um, Jeremiah? Look to the very last line in, in chapter um, chapter 39. Actually, let's look at um, verse 15. While Jeremiah had been confined in the court courtyard of the guard, the word of the Lord came to him, go and tell Ebed Melech the Cushite, this is what the Lord Almighty, the King of Israel says, I am about to fulfill my words against the city, words concerning disaster, not prosperity. At that time, they will be that they will be fulfilled before your eyes. But I will rescue you on that day, declares the Lord. You will not be given into the hands of those you fear. I will save you. You will not fall by the sword, but will escape with your life because you trust in me, declares the Lord. Now, isn't it interesting? Our psalm today started out with those who trust in the Lord are like like Mount Zion. And what I love so much is that Ebed didn't care about his life, didn't worry about whether or not his, his reputation would be destroyed. He, he cared about justice. He cared about justice. I think that is something we need to focus on. Here is a man who maybe some of you never even heard of before. He's just a little guy in the Bible here. But God exalted him. God said, I will protect you. He put his, he surrounded him. And even though Eva didn't know what would happen to him? He, he didn't care. He was willing to risk all because of his love for God, his trust in God, his fear of God and knowing God. So when you go back to Psalm 125, I really think this applies to him. And in 20, 125 verse 5, do good, O Lord, to those who are good. At the very end of that, it, he says, you will not be given into the hands of those you fear I will save you. You will not fall by the sword, but will escape with your life because you trust in me, declares the Lord. So this is the last day of February. What a great note to end it on. Um, This great man, uh, again, one of billions of great black men of color, women of color, children of color, that we don't always honor or don't even talk about, but have made a difference. He saved Jeremiah, the prophet's life, and God honored him for that. May we today walk in that same path. May we not fear, but may we trust in the Lord. And if we look to him, we look to Ebed, like what happened to him, we look to God's word, what will happen to us, May may it inspire us to be brave, to fight against injustice, to stand up for his his, uh, namesake. All right, it's time for communion. I went a little long, sorry. Let's um, take our bread right now and um, dedicate it to the Lord. Dear Lord, we're just so grateful for all the people in the world. that have heard your voice and responded, Lord. We're praying now for those members in our church that are finding themselves in a 
in a spot, Lord, that they probably would not have willingly uh, chose. But you know that they are strong, they are able, they are ready to take this, this cross, Lord. We ask for blessing on them. We ask you to strengthen them. We ask you to walk with them. We ask you to speak to them, dear God. And may this, this lead to their appointment with you, Lord. And may it lead to all our appointments with you, Lord. May your body always bring us to our knees. In Jesus' name, amen. And dear Lord, we thank you for your blood. We thank you that you, by your death, it's made us all possible for us. Thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you, dear Jesus. Again, Lord, I felt like I was really choppy with the word today, but Lord, I just hope um, that people understand that you are always surrounding us. You surrounded your son. You surround us. And the things that happened to us, you have not left us, Lord. When we're in a difficult situation, you're right with us, Lord. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you for being with Jeremiah down in that well, Lord, just like you were down in the pit with your son, dear Jesus. I just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness in your covenant. Amen. Longer than usual. Sorry. <laughs> but um, I hope this made sense because... I'm not an Old Testament person, and as you could see, I kind of stumbled through the Old Testament a little bit. But anyway, God is so good, isn't he? He's so amazing. So, Mr. Philip McClatcher sent out an exhortation from uh, the Blackabees this morning, and I want to start off reading this. <clears throat> Let me find it. Uh, Pastor Philip set this out. This is uh, Experiencing God Day by Day by Henry and Richard Blackaby. It's an exhortation to unity. And I, f I feel like it's very important to read at the start of my exhortation today. The body of Christ cannot be on the Great Commission if its members are waging war with one another. There is a crucial connection between our relationships with each other and the salvation of those around us. We might assume that during Jesus' prayer before his crucifixion, he would have prayed that his disciples would have courage or would remain faithful or remember all he had taught them. Yet, he asked that they would remain united in their love for one another. Jesus understood that it is spiritually impossible to love God, but not love others. John 13, 34 and 35. It is impossible to love me without loving the ones for whom my son died. Our lives will not convince those around us of the reality of Jesus' steadfast love if we cannot love and live in unity with our brothers and sisters. Amen. Um, this Tuesday evening, it was past Tuesday evening, I should say, I was involved in a, a Zoom conference. Uh, there were a number of people on it. Uh, it was uh, uh, primarily Americans, white and black, and uh, we had some from uh, International Brethren, just a few. But it was a, a Zoom conference on the, um, <clears throat> it was a conversation on the office of the prophet, on, on the prophetic office in the body of Christ right now. And it could have gone a lot of places, but it was, it was excellent. Uh, there was really a, a, a singular consensus that came out uh, from among those on this meeting, um, expressed in very diverse ways, diverse scriptures. It ended up, um, there was a panel of five moderated by Apostle Reggie Holiday, that would be six of us, and then there were five other brethren, uh, 
from among the audience members who were invited, who also shared on the state of the prophetic office right now. I shared um, two things uh, over the course of that meeting, and then I contributed two more in writing. Uh, we had uh, the chance to uh, summarize our statements in written form um, after the uh, live audio portion had taken place. I want to talk a little bit about a couple of those items I shared on. Uh, I don't. I. I won't get to all of them today, and perhaps next week I can finish that up. Uh, this past Wednesday night at our Kingdom Education Bible Study uh, on Zoom uh, uh, with members of Lord of the Harvest, I. I touched on several, and I'm going to touch on some of the uh, some of these as well this morning. And uh, they are part of this series we're in, which is the prophetic nature of the church. We started back on this series, um, I believe it was um, back in um, it was September or October. I know some of you have notes. Um, it's a series of prophetic nature of the church. If you have those notes with you, of course, you can look at them. I'm going to probably cover one of the items on uh, those notes. But at any rate, um, the first thing I shared about had to do with the nature of prophecy in the prophetic office in this hour, in the, in the body of Christ. And I, I wanted to start out with um, the issue of false prophecy, uh, not that that would be the major topic I wanted to discuss, but I want to introduce this idea of false prophecy, and then look at what are uh, some of the main characteristics of the true prophetic office and those who practice it. So I want to go to Zechariah chapter 13. I want to make a, um, a brief remark here about false prophecy. In Zechariah 13, and I want to look at just simply verses. Uh, um, actually, I want to just look at verse 2 of Zechariah 13. And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they shall be remembered no more. And I also will remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness or the unclean spirit. Now, it's, it's talking about false prophecy that's going to be removed by the Lord, that's going to be dealt with by the Lord. I want you to see that false prophecy, according to Zechariah 13, too, has two components. It's associated with idolatry. False prophecy makes God's people feel comfortable in their idolatry. It legitimizes their idolatry. It, it says it's okay to uh, embrace uh, these particular feelings and thoughts and desires that you hold in your heart, which are actually idolatry, which are a violation of the first commandment, having any strange gods before the Lord. And it also calls false prophecy, this idolatry, that the false prophets um, establish in the midst of God's people, it calls it an unclean spirit. Now, if we look backwards um, to the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the word unclean had to do with people uh, being separated from God and being separated from one another. When a person became unclean through sin or through idolatry or uh, by um, involving themselves in a practice that Scripture told them not to. They were rendered unclean. They couldn't go into the temple. They could not go into the temple and worship the Lord while they were unclean. So uncleanness separates people from God. They also had to separate themselves, oftentimes, from their brethren, the Israelites. So, this is saying that idolatry separates God's people from him, from himself, and from each other. 
And that false prophecy separates people from God and separates people from one another. So when Jesus came, now we're going to look forward a bit to New Covenant understanding. When Jesus came forth, one of his apostolic functions was delivering people from oppressive spirits. When Jesus set people free, practiced his um, ministry of deliverance, or what we might call in the church exorcism, uh, the spirits that Jesus encountered, three primary terms are used to describe the spirits that Jesus cast out or that uh, whose influence and power over God's people Jesus broke. Demons, it says that he, he broke the power of demons. It says he broke the power of evil spirits and he broke the power of unclean spirits. Unclean spirits, according to Zechariah 13, that Jesus was waging war against, was uh, those unclean spirits uh, fortified their power over Israel through false prophecy. So Jesus is cleansing uh, uh, the land. He's cleansing his people. He's setting his people free as the the new Moses, uh, as the new deliverer, as the king, as the Messiah, as the apostle and prophet, as the good shepherd. He's setting God's people free from demon power. He's setting God's people free from false prophecy. And he's setting God's people free from evil spirits. Now, you have to understand uh, the primary meaning of evil. There's, there's obviously a moral dimension to evil. But evil meant uh, things that cause harm to God's people, things that damage God's people. So evil spirits meant that Jesus was also cleansing the land and, and healing the people and freeing the people from spirits that cause harm to individuals. So we need to understand that that part of Jesus' apostolic ministry was to purge the land of the influences of false prophecy. Now, when we look at prophets uh, and we look at the, the, the apostolic function uh, that is within the body of Christ that was in the life of Jesus, um, I want to go first of all to an Old Testament example about what was the character trait of an authentic prophetic leader. And I want to go to Numbers chapter 12. It's interesting because, you know, Pastor Jan talked about Ebed Melech, the servant of the king, uh, rescuing Jeremiah, being a Cushite, being an Ethiopian. Um, uh, being an African, uh, uh, being black, and, and, and God using that individual powerfully and mightily uh, to save Jeremiah. We're going to see something similar here in the life of Moses. So if you go to Numbers 12, now remember the three main leaders that were leading God's people out of Israel were Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Now, Moses is called the greatest of all prophets. However, I, I, I would suggest, because of the, the terminology that's used to describe Moses' ministry, particularly when the Lord appeared to him in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, the emphasis on the fact that Moses was going to be sent to Pharaoh, that the Lord was going to send Moses to deliver God's people, that he was going to send Moses to reveal to the enslaved uh, Jewish population, uh, the enslaved Hebrew population in Egypt, uh, emphasizes this apostolic dimension. In the Greek Old Testament, the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, the term apostello is used there to describe Moses' ministry. Apostello is one who is sent on an apostolic mission. That will become the key uh, verb form used in the New Testament where the Lord sends his apostles and sends his church forth and sends his people forth in an apostolic witness under New Covenant terms. 
I would suggest that Moses represents the prophetic office. He also represents the apostolic office. That fluidity is not a problematic. In Acts chapter 13, you don't have to turn to that, uh, but it talks about certain prophets and teachers gathered together from the Antioch church and they ministered to the Lord and fasted and the Lord sent out Barnabas and Paul on what is called Paul's first apostolic mission, which takes place, of course, in Acts 13 and Acts 14. And it's the, the first um, thrust of Paul's uh, ministry, of Paul's apostolic ministry um, into the Gentile world uh, with Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas are called prophets and teachers in, in Acts 13. And then by the time they are sent out in Acts 13 and 14, they're called apostles. And that's actually the first time Paul and Barnabas are called apostles in the book of Acts. So you see that it is from this, this pool of prophets and teachers in the New Testament church that the Lord raises up apostles. In other words, an apostle may start as a teacher, may start as a prophet, uh, but, but ultimately enters into that apostolic commissioning. Moses is called a prophet, but he has an apostolic function. And when we look at these three leaders, Moses uh, and uh, Aaron and Miriam, Moses would represent the apostolic. Aaron would represent the priesthood, uh, the, the teaching dimension, the worship dimension uh, in uh, Israel. And Miriam would represent the prophetic. And it's important to see a contrast. Even if, even if we don't uh, except that Moses represents an apostolic figure, there is clearly a contrast between the type of prophet Miriam is and the type of prophet Moses is. And I want you to see that here in Numbers 12. Numbers 12, 1, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. Moses' wife was an African, just like Ebed Melech. She, she was not a Jew. And you, you, you see a, there is a racial issue here at work in Numbers 12. It's not the same kind of uh, racial issues that we've seen in um, America necessarily, but it is a racial issue. And it shows to us that um, God's people have always had, there's always a racial tension uh, within God's people, whether it's the uh, um, racial tension here between Jew and non-Jew, Hebrew and non-Hebrew at this point, um, you know, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron being Hebrews, Moses' wife being a non-Hebrew, being a Cushite. Um, and what this shows us is that, see, to, to ignore racial issues is to ignore biblical issues. Okay, we're not talking about n not simply how America defines racism or, or other nations define racism. We're, we're looking at a biblical issue here. When, when Paul says in Galatians 3.28, there is no longer male or female, no longer slave nor free, no longer Jew nor non-Jew, Jew nor Greek, He's, he's saying there are, these are, there are racial tensions, just like there are tensions between men and women and there are tensions between uh, uh, slave and free or tensions between wealthy and poor. Uh, they just exist in human cultures. And the church needs to guard against those issues pressing forth in the church. We see the same thing here taking place. Behind the spiritual implications. There are spiritual implications in Numbers 12, but there are racial issues as well. And the church has to ever be on guard about this. Again, when we talk about looking at the, the, the statistics of those who claim to be Christians who voted in the last presidential election, uh, the majority of those who identify themselves as white Christians voted for Donald Trump. The majority of those who claim themselves to be Christians of color voted for Biden. And what I've simply said is we have a, a racial issue at work in the body of Christ. Whatever you make out of those statistics, there is clearly 
some racial tension. And when we're talking about the division in the church, it's, it's, the church is divided in many ways, but one of those aspects is racial. And we just, we simply need to see that. That's not the main point I want to make from, from Numbers 12, because the main point I'm trying to make is what are the characteristics of someone who really speaks for the Lord prophetically? Well, let's look at this, and then we'll look at a couple verses in the Gospel of John, and then we'll go on to my second point. Now, Miriam and Aaron speak against Moses because of the Cushite woman he married, for he'd married a Cushite woman. What, what? They're speaking against Moses because he has a, 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 a multiracial marriage. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? What those two thoughts might have to do with each other is that somehow, somehow Aaron and Miriam perceived because Moses' wife and you know your spouse is a tremendous influence on your thinking, a tremendous influence on your theology, a tremendous tremendous influence on your life, a tremendous influence in terms of how you hear the Lord. Because when you're married to someone, you know, that person hears the Lord too. I remember Will McFarland said many years, uh, people always want to hear the word uh, of a prophet. Oh, I, I just, I need a prophetic word. And Will said, and, and, and the prophet is, is sleeping in the bed next to you. And he was making reference to Hear the, hear the word of the Lord from the prophet who's your spouse. Uh, so, so this, this has to contribute into the background in terms of what Miriam and Aaron are thinking. Has he just spoken through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? I, 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 I want to look at as many dimensions as we can see here. There's, there's an issue of competition. There's an issue of jealousy here that's going on. We need to be aware of these things in the body of Christ. Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. See, here's, here's the, the most important thing in this, our, our banter back and forth about, well, you say you've heard from the Lord. Well, we've heard from the Lord. And hey, you know, we're both Christians. And why, why what we say is the exact opposite of what you say. Well, guess what? Not everybody can be right, okay? In other words, people can claim to hear the Lord, but claiming to hear the Lord, that's not self-authenticating. In other words, oh, the Lord told me this. Well, so what? I told my dog something yesterday. Do we understand that? You're saying the Lord said thus and so to you. It's not self-authenticating. But see, here's, here's the thing that we need to understand. The Lord heard what was said. And the Lord hears now what's being said. Now let's see what the Lord says. Now this is interjected into the text. Verse 3, Now the man Moses was very meek, more so than all the people that were on the face of the earth. Now that's inserted to show you that in a conflict between Thus says the Lord, and thus says the Lord, between somebody who claims to be a prophet and someone else who claims to be a prophet, because of someone else claiming to hear from the Lord and another person claiming to hear the opposite or something different from the Lord. The issue is not the strength of the gift. It's not how many hits somebody has on Twitter. It's not how many followers someone has on social media. It's not even how large of a church a person has. The issue is character. This, this is my point number one. When we're dealing with the difference between true and false prophecy, or when we're simply dealing with authentication of a true prophet, Character is the bottom line, not gifting and not anointing. Character. What a man's gift builds up, his character tears down. I, I first heard that from uh, Papa Pete back years ago. Moses is meek. Meekness means yieldedness because of inner brokenness. Remember the David who we, we've, we've watched through all the Psalms, the king, the mighty one, 
the man after God's own heart, the prophetic worship leader of Israel. At a certain point in the Psalms, David says, I am poor and needy. And it's when he begins to identify himself, not with big shot King David, mighty man of faith and power David, but when he begins to identify with the poor and needy in the latter sections of the Psalms, David begins to pray and worship and moves from lament into praise because he begins to identify himself with the poor and needy. Now, the, the, the Hebrew root poor and needy, uh, for, for many of the terms used for poor and needy, have to do with brokenness and meekness. Now, the man Moses was very meek, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam, come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. Now, the tent of meeting was the, was the, 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 the mini tabernacle where Moses used to go and the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire and the Lord Yahweh would speak mouth to mouth or face to face with Moses. So this is a summoning into the presence of the Lord for the Lord to determine the solution for this prophetic conflict. Lord, bring your prophets and apostles into your tent and speak to them in this hour, Lord, and resolve this conflict between true prophecy and false prophecy in the body of Christ in the name of Jesus. And the three of them came out and the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam and they both came forward. And he said, now this, you really need to see this. This is very important. Hear my words, the Lord says. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. The Lord uses dreams and visions, supernatural gift aspects to reveal himself to prophets. Except the Lord's going to say, I use that to reveal that to lesser prophets. And he's going to make a distinction between lesser prophets and greater prophets at this point. There is a, a, a class of prophets that is greater than a class of people who predominantly prophesy. So there's a whole group of people and they're always having dreams, they're always having visions, and the Lord is saying, fair enough. That gives them a certain right to prophecy. I, I do reveal myself to a certain degree to those who have these supernatural experiences. And there, there are people who, who, I mean, post after post, prophecy after prophecy, teaching after teaching, message after message, it's dreams and visions, supernatural phenomenon, and they say, we're prophets. The Lord's not denying that. He says, but you're a lower class of prophet from what Moses is. And this is kind of an in-your-face to Miriam and Aaron at this point. It's an in-your-face. So you have dreams and visions. Okay, that makes you prophetic. But he continues and he says, he says, not so with my servant Moses. He's in a different class. Why? He is faithful in all my house. It's not about supernatural phenomenon, giftings. It's about character. It's about being faithful to the Lord. And someone who's faithful is this. A faithful person's simple uh, example is, I tell you to do something and you do it. That's faithful. You promise to do something and you carry out what you promise. That's faithful. And the Lord is saying, Moses does what I tell him. His, the basis of his prophetic ministry isn't how many dreams and visions and prophetic words he gets. The basis is faithfulness in the house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, literally in the Hebrew, face to face, clearly and not in riddles. 
means a dream and a vision is a mediated reality. It's a, it's a, it's a parable. It's a, a, a riddle. Uh, Moses, the Lord speaks face to face to him, and it says, in the form of the Lord, he beholds me. He beholds the form of the Lord. This is God directly, not God immediately. A dream and a vision is not the same as the Lord appearing. A dream and a vision is not the Lord speaking face to face. It's a supernatural phenomenon that has a certain amount of validity, but not the kind of validity that is based on faithfulness, that's based on character, that's based on integrity, that's based on righteousness, that's based on obedience. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? You have dreams and visions. I talked to him face to face. Why were you not afraid? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and the Lord departed. Now remember, Moses is the meekest. I want you to see why Moses is the meekest. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. The Lord leaves, and here's what happens. He leaves, talking about the three of them, in this prophetic conflict. Moses is left with affirmation and commendation. Miriam is left with leprosy. Aaron is left, well, shaking in his boots in fear. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. Now, here's the thing. Remember Zechariah 13 talked about an unclean spirit. Unclean spirit of false prophecy separates you from God and from one another. What did leprosy do under Old Covenant terms, you were separated from God and you were quarantined, separated from among the people. Why? You speak an unclean spirit, you yourself become unclean. It's not just that, 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 that you render other people unclean uh, from each other, you cause division in the church, and you separate people from their God, but you yourself become unclean. And that's what the Lord is trying to demonstrate here with Miriam. And Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly in sin. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, O oh God, Please heal her, please. Now here's why Moses is faithful. Here's why Moses is meek. Moses should have just said, well, you guys got what you deserved. But you see, Moses' faithful prophetic call that's on him goes beyond himself. It goes beyond his own tribe. It goes beyond those who agree with him. Moses' prophetic heart envelops and surrounds all of God's people, those with him, not with him, those who affirm him and those who slander him and say he's not speaking truly. That's what Miriam and Aaron did. Well, you're not speaking truly. And the Lord said, oh, yes, he is. We need to understand that legitimate, real prophetic intercession, and I've been talking about that for a number of weeks, encompasses all of God's people. Why is Moses the meekest? Why is Moses affirmed as being faithful in all the house? Because even these two that have turned against him, he begins to make intercession for them. Now the Lord hears his intercession. And I've said this over and over again, this is what we need in this hour. We want real prophets, okay? How about praying for the entire body of Christ to become one? See, Moses needs Aaron and Miriam. God's people need Moses, or need uh, uh, Aaron and Miriam. God's people need needs all need God's people need all of God's leaders in this hour. And we, the real prophetic and apostolic authority in the house, is going to be praying for all of God's people to be one and to be reconciled. 
Now the Lord said to Moses, he says heal her. Now the Lord is going to heed Moses' prayer, but there will be consequences. See, we've got to understand this in this hour. Praying for God to forgive the false prophets and praying for God to restore the false prophets. Praying for God to heal and restore those people in the body of Christ who are not obeying the Lord right now does not mean we're, we're just overlooking what people have done. There's damage caused by false prophecy. There's damage caused by abusive and disobedient leaders in the body of Christ. There's damage caused, but if we're really going to be Moses-like apostolic prophetic figures, we need to pray for all of God's people to be restored. It doesn't mean there won't be consequences. God can forgive and restore with consequences. We can pray that he will minimize those consequences. And, and, and uh, as we talked about in, in Psalm 51, and revoke the law of cause and effect and, and supersede the law of cause and effect, which means there are consequences for our sins, but supersede it with the law of atonement the law of transformation, the law of giving a person the chance to rewrite their history. Now, there are going to be people that come out of this situation right now with consequences because of the false prophecy they've embraced and because they have, they have placed that false prophecy on the body of Christ. Actually, they've deceived the body of Christ. They've deluded the body of Christ. They've misled the body of Christ. There are going to be consequences. But we need to pray that when they come out of those consequences, we need to pray like Moses prayed. And Moses prayed. He cried out to the Lord, Oh God, please heal her, please. See, see the, the, the hearts of the false prophets are going to be revealed by their falsehood. The hearts of the true prophets are going to be revealed because they pray for mercy for the false prophets or those who, who are involved in false prophecy. The Lord said to Moses, if her father, we're back to verse 14, I'm closing this up. If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut outside the camp seven days and after that she may be brought in again. Consequences but forgiveness and restoration. So Miriam was shut outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out on the march until Miriam was brought in again. Notice, Miriam's being separated from the Lord hindered the work of God among God's people. There are some good brothers and sisters in Christ who've been misled by false prophecy. You know, I, I want to distinguish between the term false prophet and false prophecy. False prophet is a very serious, serious charge. False prophecy, on the other hand, a, a legitimate believer has fallen, fallen aside or, or been misled and, and, and needs to be restored. But the reason for it is the church needs all of the body of Christ right now. We, 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 we don't just need the Democrat Christians who see justice. We don't just need the, the Republican Christians who, 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 who understand the importance of some clear values, kingdom values. We need them all. The people did not set out on the march till Miriam was brought in again. After that, the people set out from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Now, I want you to see a New Testament parallel in the Gospel of John. Go with me to John 5. We're going to look to John 5 and John 7, then we're going to go to point 2 that I want to make here. Gospel of John, chapter 5. Moses is faithful in all the house. What is Jesus? And what Moses is and what Jesus is is what we need to be right now if we're going to hear from God, if we're going to be faithful. 
Jesus says this in John 5, 19. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will the Father show the Son so that you may marvel. Now we're going to see an apostolic function of Jesus and a prophetic function of Jesus at this point. The apostolic function is what Jesus does. The prophetic function is what Jesus says. Uh, Jesus speaks prophetically later on in this passage or gives us the basis of his speaking. What he's doing here, he says he does nothing of himself of his own accord. He waits to see what the Father is doing. See, this is the picture of legitimate, apostolic, prophetic activity in, under New Covenant terms. Moses is faithful in all the house. So is Jesus under New Covenant terms, just as Moses is under Old Covenant terms. And Jesus' faithfulness is he doesn't do anything except the Father does it first. There's a solidarity between the Father and the Son. Can we say in our church activities, can we say in our ministries, can we say in our prophetic activities, can we say as leaders, can we say as brothers and sisters in Christ how we live our lives, can we say that we only do what we see the Father doing? Well, that's our goal. That's the, the vision that Jesus gives to us. This is what creates faithfulness in God's house looking to the Father first and saying, Father, what are you doing here? Father, what would you have me do? That's the apostolic function. And then if we drop down to verse 30, Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. He again refers to doing. But then he says, as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. Now, hearing and judging is hearing and judging gives Jesus the ability to speak and it contributes to his ability to do. We see apostolic and prophetic functions here taking place in Jesus. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me on a mission. So Jesus is talking here about how it is that you're faithful in all the house. You only do what you see the Father doing, and you only speak. You only do based on the Father's will. See, this is, this is what makes us faithful in all the house. Our, our, our basic motivation is to do the will of God. It's not to promote ourselves. It's not to promote our own ministries. It's not to somehow um, accumulate political power. It's not to have the biggest church, the most followers. It's to be obedient to the will of God. Now notice when he finishes this, he says in verse 31, what he just finished the statement in verse 30, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not deemed true. This self-affirming, self-affirmation, this drive to be somebody is a source of false prophecy. Finally, Jesus says in chapter 7 of the Gospel of John, and in chapter 7 there... Um, there, there's this, they're, they're having a discussion leading up to verse 16 about true and false teaching. Jesus says in verse 16, he answered them, my teachings do not belong to me. They are not mine, but his who sent me. See, Jesus again, what's the father doing? What's the father saying? For what purpose has the Father sent me? And then he gives us another illustration about what it means to be faithful in all the house, to only do what we see the Father doing, to only speak based on the Father's will as it is revealed to us. 
And then the third thing is, how do we distinguish the tr truth from falsehood, whether it's true teaching, false teaching, true prophecy, false prophecy, a true apostle, a false apostle. If anyone's will, some translations say, if anyone desires, same nuance of the Greek word, if anyone's desire is to do God's will, if your basic motivation is, this is what I want, to do God's will in any and every situation in which I find myself, personal, individual, corporate, family, church, nation, job, if my desire is to do God's will, and that's the the motivating factor in my life, that person will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. So your desire to do God's will is your safeguard. That's what that people, give me a teaching on how to discern um, true prophecy from false prophecy. Well, here's a simple one. It's, it's, it's even greater than just false prophecy and true prophecy. It's Truth and falsehood in general. Here's a very simple teaching on how to stay safe. Desire to do God's will. That's your greatest protection. So when we wake up in the morning, our prayer should be, Lord, today, perfect within me. By your grace, by your steadfast love, by your faithfulness, by the work of your spirit, perfect within me the desire to do your will. Perfect that within me today, Lord. And everything else will fall into place. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. You want to know why false prophecy is so prevalent? Because people are seeking their own glory. They want a name for themselves. And so they come up with prophecies. They hear things and say, oh, the Lord spoke to me. But to say the Lord spoke to you is self-authenticating. You can say the Lord spoke to you, but that doesn't authenticate what you're saying. Your, your consistency with the Word of God, the very fact that the words you speak draw people closer to the Lord and each other, the very fact that the words you speak release the grace of God, the very fact that the words you speak are approved by your brothers and sisters surround you. Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, one prophet speaks, the others judge. Those are the things that will authenticate you, not because you get up and say, the Lord spoke to me. As I said, you tell me the Lord spoke to me, I say, well, I spoke to my dog yesterday too. So what? Let's see. Let's see. But again, we have to see one of the greatest motivations that opens up falsehood into the body of Christ is people seeking their own glory as opposed to what verse 18 closes with, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true and in him there is no falsehood. Okay, second point I want to make. If you have those notes, you can go to Roman numeral number three. Now, I'm not going to, we're not going to have time to read all of these because if we're going to finish, if we're going to finish uh, this second point I'm, I'm making, or at least start on it, we can, we can complete it next week. We, we um, need to just give you some examples and then we're going to go, we're going to go ultimately to Revelation chapter one. I've talked about this a number of times with my own congregation, but we need to see it again in, 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 in another context. Uh, and, of course, there, there are people who aren't from Lord of the Harvest listening to this now. Concerning the questions regarding the apostolic office and what the Lord is doing in this hour, I would like to point out these observations. There are three illustrations of apostolic commissioning that lead to three different iterations of apostles in the New Testament. The New Testament has an example of three different types of apostles in the New Testament. I'm just going to name the three because that, I, I, that's not the main point um, of this to, to really get into the three, but to see that there are three and to see what the implications are for the third 
type of apostolic office, but I'll, I'll list you the, the references. If you have the notes, you have it in front of you. First of all, there are in the New Testament what we would call historical post-resurrection apostles. Jesus, Jesus, the historical Jesus lived for 33 and a half years. In the last three and a half years of his life, his ministry, he, he had disciples who followed them, who followed him. And, and from those disciples that followed the historical Jesus, you have your first type of apostle commissioned by Jesus in the New Testament. And they're post-resurrection apostles. Jesus dies. They see him die. He's raised from the dead. And of course, as Acts chapter 1 says, and the end of the tail end of the, um, the, the, the four gospels say, Jesus spent time after he was raised from the dead, but before he ascended to heaven. And Acts chapter 1 actually says he spent 40 days with them, teaching them things about the kingdom of God. Those are called post-resurrection apostles. They see Jesus after he's raised from the dead. And the list of those, or the verses that make reference to them, you can write these down, look at them later. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 7, and Revelation 21, verse 14. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 7 lists all these uh, post-resurrection apostles, all the ones that Jesus appeared to after he was raised from the dead and commissioned them as apostles. Revelation 21, 14 says, the foundation of the, um, the heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the foundation of that is the 12 apostles of the Lamb. That's your, your original 12 apostles. There's a second category of apostles in the New Testament. The post-ascension apostles. Now see, Jesus didn't just appoint apostles after he was raised from the dead, but before he ascended to heaven. After he ascended to heaven, he meets with Paul on the road to Damascus. Now, I, uh, the reference to post-ascension apostles would be 1 Corinthians 15, 8 through 11, where Paul leaves off in verse 7 with the post-resurrection apostles. He includes himself in verses 8 through 11. He's a post-ascension. Jesus appears to Paul after he ascends to heaven. Now, the importance of the ascension is this. Ascension is a term that, that speaks of someone being anointed as king, crowned as king. A king ascends his throne when he's made to be the king. Jesus' ascension is termed that way because now he's enthroned in heaven. After his resurrection from the dead, he ascends to heaven and he is made, constituted, declared in a ceremony to be king of all the universe for all time. Daniel 7, son of man, given the kingdom of the Most High God. Now that is a point that I'm going to look at perhaps next week. That's another point I raised at this uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, and we'll talk about that one at, at another time. So Paul talks about his uh, his post-ascension apostolic ministry in 1 Corinthians 15, 8 through 11, and then three times in the book of Acts, Paul relates his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus and talks about his apostolic call. And that would be in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. We've already made reference to the fact that in Acts 13, um, let me check the verse references I have uh, written down here. In Acts 13, verse 1, Paul and Barnabas are called prophets and teachers, and they go out into this apostolic journey, Paul's first missionary apostolic journey, and all of a sudden, they're commissioned by the Lord to go forth in Acts 13, and then all of a sudden, they're called apostles in Acts 14, 4 and 14, 14. That's another example of post-ascension apostles. But all that background is to bring us quickly to Revelation chapter 1. 
The apostles in Revelation chapter 1 are Revelation 1 apostles. And this is very important. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 1. I'm going to read this and we'll probably uh, call it a uh, call it a morning. This is important. Revelation chapter 1. All right. Now if if you're there in Revelation 1, the the primary Reference to Revelation 1 apostles are in Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. So you'll go to verse 9, but let me make a few comments. In Revelation chapter 1, remember this is about 40 years after Jesus is raised from the dead, ascends to heaven. The church has been in existence at 35 years or so. And the church comes into some great difficulty in terms of persecution. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus appears to John. This is who, who he says. Um, uh, verse uh, 1 actually says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, an unveiling of Jesus, which God gave him, gave to Jesus, to show to his servants, his apostles and prophets, the things that must soon take place. He, that's God made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. God sent his angel, Jesus, to Jesus' servant, John. So John, and by all understanding, this is John who was one of the original 12 apostles. Now, he's already been called as a post-resurrection apostle, as a historical disciple of Jesus apostle. Um, he's, he's, he was there. He saw Jesus when Jesus was raised from the dead uh, before Jesus ascended. He's already an apostle of the first type. Paul is an apostle of the second type. And this is going to be very interesting that an apostle of the first type becomes an apostle of the third type. But this is something very important. There, the book of Revelation is a pattern for the future of church history. The book of Revelation is called a prophecy. Uh, verse 2 says uh, in chapter 1, uh, And this servant John bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. The whole book of Revelation is going to be this, uh, this revelation that John sees and he bears witness to Jesus in Revelation 19.10 says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So this is about both an apostolic commission and the spirit of prophecy. It applies to both apostles and prophets, and it applies to the apostolic and prophetic anointing that's on the entire body of Christ. Verse 3 says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. The entire book of Revelation, chapter 1 through 22, is a prophecy. It's a prophetic utterance. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. The time is near. As a, as a prophecy, it's, it's given, obviously, to those who heard it at that point. But it's a prophecy that has implications for the entire history of the church. It, it teaches us, it gives us a pattern for the future of church history, how we deal with apostolic issues in the body of Christ for the remainder of the life of the church. This idea of trying to want to make a uh, book of Revelation either all fulfilled in 70 AD, preterism, full preterism, or wanting to push it to all be fulfilled in some final three and a half year period at the end of time misses the point of the book of Revelation. It was fulfilled in 70 AD. It will be fulfilled before Jesus returns. And it's being fulfilled throughout the entire church history. It's a pattern. All right. Now, here's the pattern. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus appears to John during a time of persecution by the Roman Empire. A time of great trouble, turmoil, and confusion in the church in which Jesus commissions both apostles and prophets to, first of all, bear witness to Christ, to be faithful to his word, second, to evaluate and prophesy to the churches they serve 
so that those churches might persevere in their testimony and divine call, so that they might walk in heavenly worship and apostolic revelation, and so that they might overcome political, religious, cultural obstacles to the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom and their prophetic witness. The Lord raises up a new prophetic office, a third kind of apostle, to get the church through difficult times and cause the church to bear witness to Jesus and to fulfill their destiny as the body of Christ. It's exactly where we are right now. We need this third kind of iteration, this third type of apostolic ministry to be raised up. It is the Lord coming with a special what? What is the title of this book? The Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the Apocalypsis. It's the unveiling of Jesus. Jesus needs to be unveiled in a new, powerful, hitherto unexperienced by the church manner so the church can deal with what's in front of it. What is our prophetic hope in this hour of confusion and division? Pestilence, war, famine, exile. What is our hope that Jesus will unveil himself in a new, fresh, powerful way to equip the church for this hour? See, that's the significance of a, a, a Category 1 apostle being a Category 3 apostle. John, you've been my apostle since I called you when I was alive. You've been my, my disciple, my apostle for all these years. At this point when revelation takes place, he may be the only apostle left alive who hasn't been martyred. But you need a fresh vision. You need to see something you didn't even see in being the first kind of an apostle. And by the way, that first kind of apostle is a foundation to the new Jerusalem, as we said in Revelation 21.14. This experience in the first century provides the church with a pattern for the remainder of church history until the return of Christ at the second coming. The book of Revelation is called a prophecy, therefore it provides the pattern for prophetic and apostolic ministry for the church throughout her existence in history. It is interesting that Jesus appears to John, one of his original apostles, a historical post-resurrection iteration or type, a second time in Revelation 1, he's already commissioned him in one kind of apostolic ministry. He's bequeathed to him one kind of apostolic anointing, but he's given him another one. If you look in 117, now, Jesus appears to John. Um, he hears a voice behind him like a trumpet in Revelation 1.10, and, and this voice gives him an apostolic commission in verse 10. And then John says in verse 12, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. That represents the church. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, Jesus being called a son of man in Revelation 1 here refers this back to Daniel 7, which we'll look at at a future future meeting, but that's important. That's his title and status as the chief apostolic voice, the king over God's kingdom and human history. He was like a son of man, clothed in a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. His hairs of his head were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Seven stars means seven apostolic leaders sent to the seven churches, seven golden lampstands in which he stands, speaks of the seven churches. Seven speaks of covenant reality. This is a a 
the, whenever the Lord appears a second time, that's called covenant renewal. Remember, we've talked about Moses, and, and we are, we are going to look at Moses in Exodus 32, 33, and 34 as a confirmation of this pattern, but we'll, that'll probably be for a future time too. I don't believe we'll have the time this week. But you remember, Moses goes up to the mountain and sees the Lord in Exodus 32, and he gets the, the, the tablets of the covenant. He sees God a first time. And when you see the Lord, you become commissioned in a, in a, in a, in a new, uh, authority. Moses, maybe he goes up as a prophet the first time on the Mount Sinai with Yahweh, with the Lord in Exodus 32, and he comes, uh, back down, uh, with, with a kind of apostolic commissioning. He goes up as a prophet, comes down as an apostle. The people have made a golden calf while he's gone. The Lord's angry. Moses is angry. Moses destroys the tablets. God says he's going to destroy the people. Moses makes an intercession to the Lord and cries out to the Lord, please spare your people. The Lord does. And then Moses goes up on the mountain in chapter 33 and 34 a second time. And remember, it's when he comes down at the end of chapter 34, when Moses comes down the mountain the second time, it says his face glistened with transfiguring light the people couldn't even couldn't even deal with the light of god that was coming off his face because of this second revelation see moses it took him two revelations prophet apostle new kind of apostle the second time he goes up and encounters the lord see this second time that john is seeing jesus has a pattern under the Old Covenant, two times Moses saw the Lord. First time he got the covenant, the people violated the covenant. Second time it's covenant renewal. First apostolic call of John is covenant. Second is covenant renewal. See, brethren, we need Jesus to appear powerfully and mightily right now in the midst of the church because we need a covenant renewal in the church. A church divided a church influenced by false prophecy, a church unclean, a church disobedient. We need covenant renewal. And the way that happens is to see the Lord a second time. And that's why verse 17, John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now in my notes, John's falling at his feet as dead in Revelation 1.17 speaks that this is an unveiling to John unlike anything he's ever experienced. Even, even I said here, including Jesus' post-resurrection appearances to the disciples in Gospels, in the Gospels and in Acts. Why? Because we need something fresh and new for covenant renewal. This isn't just making the covenant the first time. See, the, the, every year, every year, the children of Israel went up to Jerusalem three times a year to, to re-celebrate over and over and over again Passover, over and over again Pentecost, over and over again Tabernacles. Why? Because each year the expression was an expression of covenant renewal. Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is the Lord every year cleansing the sanctuary, cleansing it from the uncleanness of God's people so that the Lord could remain in their midst. See, Yom Kippur is for the Lord. It's not necessarily for the people. I mean, our sins are forgiven and we're cleansed. But see, for the Lord to dwell in the midst of his people, he has to renew the covenant each year. Covenant renewal is very important. We need to be, train, be praying for covenant renewal right now. See, when the children of Israel were exiled from the land, that's the second great historical situation among the Jews. The first one was the ransom from Egypt, the deliverance from Egypt by the Lord. Exile is that the people are removed from the land because of their impurity. The land has to hold its Sabbath. The land has to be, it has to, the land has to partake in its own Sabbath rest. It has to be cleansed by the Lord. It has to be renewed. It has to be replenished. 
a Sabbath year was an agricultural phenomenon. The land needs to be replenished. The Lord in every sabbatical year was renewing his covenant with the land. And it should have been with God's people as well, except God's people got out of the habit of keeping the sabbatical year and perhaps never kept the jubilee year, which was every 50 years. So when the people are removed from the land, it's that they might be purified and the Lord might renew the covenant. So covenant renewal is what Revelation chapter 1, in fact, it's what the whole book of Revelation is about. It's saying, I will unveil myself and raise up a, a new level of apostolic and prophetic ministry periodically throughout church history when my covenant needs to be renewed with my people because of their impurity, because of their sin, their disobedience, their listening to false teaching, their listening to false prophecy. This image helps us to understand the significance of a third different in intensity iteration of the apostolic office and its commissioning in Revelation 1. When God's people come in the seasons, okay, we're going to close. Whenever I get my little sign that says battery is, 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 is uh, getting very low, that's my time to, to finish. We'll finish up. When God's people come in the seasons of intense persecution and trouble, as occurs in the book of Revelation and is described as great tribulation in 714, the Lord counters that evil with a powerful and hereto unexperienced vision and unveiling of his person and his grace in order to empower his apostolic and prophetic church to prevail in his purposes against, <laughs> who are the foes in the book of Revelation? Against beast-like empires, manifestations of false prophecy, and seductive powers of materialism and fleshly desires of Babylon. And we see the beast and the false prophet in Revelation 13. We see the the, the great harlot, Babylon, in chapter 17 and 18. The third type of apostolic office will exist to lead the church through difficulty until he returns. Now, the last verse I want to look at, and this is where we'll close, Revelation 7. John sees this vision of a great multitude from every tribe and tongue and people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That's um, Revelation 7, 9. And there's this great worship service in heaven. All these different kinds of people. Do you know they're not just white people in heaven? Do, do, do we understand that? Uh, all these different nations of people are there in heaven and it's this powerful worship service taking place in heaven, heavenly worship. And in verse 13, one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes? Who, 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 what, what is this, this, this massive group, this great multitude from every nation? Who are these clothed, clothed in white robes and from where have they come? The elder the, the, the supernatural uh, power and principality in heaven asks John, who's been caught up to heaven, who, who, who are these? And he's like, sir, you know. John goes, I don't know, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And then there's more comment on it. But and again, there are people who will tell us the Great Tribulation took place around the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. There are those who reserve the Great Tribulation for this period at the end of time. Well, they're, 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 they're both essentially right. Actually, there's no definite article in the Greek. It doesn't say they are the ones who came out of the Great Tribulation. It's those who came out of Great Tribulation. 
you, John, you're seeing the church circa 70 AD who is being persecuted now, but these remain faithful to the Lord. Church, at the end of time, you will see a group of people coming through great tribulation who have purified themselves with their faithfulness to apostolic testimony. You've seen all through church history when these the great uprisings of, of beast-like political powers and false prophecies and false religions and false worldviews and false human philosophies begin to dominate the earth and try to dominate God's people. You'll see this whenever that, that spirit of harlotry that says, come and lie with me, consumerism, materialism, wealth, human human pleasure, human protection, human safety. When all these things come to seduce the church through its entire history, the Lord will unveil Jesus. Jesus will come. He'll visit the people. He'll visit the house. He'll visit the nations of the world and raise up those who will bear witness to him in a time of great tribulation, a time of great affliction, a time of great suffering. We are there now. Father, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus. We need the character of faithfulness to be true prophets for true apostolic and prophetic testimony to empower your church and to come forth from the mouths and lives of your people. Lord, we need an unveiling, a fresh unveiling and apostolic commissioning in the church right now to bring the church out of Babylon in its 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 carnal man Babylon just a Babylon that is is manifested clearly by its carnal worldly desires and solutions that many in the church are embracing now and saying, thus says the Lord, it's okay to do. Well, that's idolatry, Lord. That's false prophecy, Lord. Unveil your son. Cause your church to rise up, Lord. And may those who find themselves on the right side of the equation with the Lord, may they pray as Moses did. May they make intercession as Moses did and as John did in the book of Revelation that all of your church would be healed and that all of your church will enter into everything you have for your church in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. God bless you, brethren. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.